So I'm excited to bring up our morning uh, keynote speaker today, Angie Stegall. Um, Angie Stegall is a small business coach and an award-winning author of four books, including her newest, Make Some Room, Powerful Life Lessons, inspired by an epic 16-day Colorado River rafting through the Grand Canyon. And I'm also excited because Angie was one of my students, and I have just watched her really blossom into sharing her story with the world. She's a woman who is fearless, going out into different places, and kind of bringing those back to really um, not just share her story with others, but to just explore herself and talk about how she's learning about herself and growing. And I think in sharing that part of who she is, we really get to reap the benefits. So welcome to the stage, Amy. downstairs this morning and my word is bravery and you're going to find out why in this talk that I'm going to do with you this morning. Um, my name is Angie Madsen Stigall. My husband and I run a travel blog, Yukon and Bean. I am Bean because I have a little bit of a coffee addiction <clears throat> and my husband is Yukon because he literally looks like Yukon Cornelius from Rudolph the Red Nose He has a giant beard and he puts a red toboggan on and it's hilarious. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk about my journey towards boldness and bravery, 14 seconds at a time. So, will we use the clicker? It works. All right. By looking at me, you might not see me as the adventurous type. I don't have the athletic body type. I don't participate in extreme sports. I am not at all coordinated. But. Travel is one of my core values. It is something that I <clears throat> love to do. And an opportunity to travel, once given to me, is not often turned down. So when an invitation came in 2013 for my husband Nelson and I to join a private trip to raft 225 miles of the Grand Canyon over 16 days, we said yes. My husband and I are both small business owners. I've been in business 11 years at that point. He had been in business for seven years at that point. We knew there was gonna be some coordination to shut our businesses down for a month. And we knew we would need to find someone to take care of our house and our pets, etc. And we did it. We figured it out. Going on the Grand Canyon <laughs> takes an enormous amount of gear. We had 16 people on our trip, and this is all the personal gear that you need. Going on the Grand Canyon also takes very large boats, a lot of food, and very big coolers. So this was the, the setup as we were getting ready to go. On a Tuesday in June in 2013, we rigged these 18-foot inflatable boats in a sweltering 110 degree weather, and we push ourselves off into the Colorado River for a 16 day adventure. I just wanna share a typical kitchen setup. This is, your, this is your kitchen, and everything fits in the boat, comes out of the boat, goes back into the boat every single day. This is called a groover. <laughs> this is where you do your nature visit. And it is outside, and it has a beautiful view. So. <laughs> this gives you the scope of how big the Grand Canyon really is. You see the tiny little people there, and you see 18-foot boats that look very, very small. It is huge in the Grand Canyon. We had fun. We swam the rapids in the little Colorado River without the boats, because they were safe. We hiked far up into the hills, along the rocks, and on trails to see beautiful, beautiful sights. <laughs> breathtaking. We hiked up to see the granaries at Nankaweep. These are Native American granaries where they stored their food far up above the water. And we stopped to see the sacred waters of Havasu, where it connects with the Colorado River. 
Our weather was hot, but it was exceptionally nice the whole time. I think we had three raindrops for the whole trip. And most days, we were smiling. I'll talk about when we weren't smiling in a minute. So, this is a picture of House Rock Rapid. It is one of the biggest ones we come to first. And I want to go back to my first statement, that you might not see me as the adventurous type of person. In fact, one of our trip mates, upon meeting us before we left, said, you guys don't look like river people. You're on the trip with us? <laughs> okay. So I'll say it again. I do not participate in extreme sports, right? I am not a huge risk taker. But this is significant because on the Colorado River, in the Grand Canyon, everything is big and extreme. The weather, the remoteness, and the rapids. On a normal river, you'll have class one through five. Because of the place that the Grand Canyon is, the rapids are rated one to 10. They're big. Very, very big. And once you begin your Grand Canyon trip on a raft, the only two ways to get out of the canyon are to hike out at Phantom Ranch on day eight, or to be helicoptered out because you are hurt or dead. It's a big deal. So, the rapids are dangerous, and we humans are puny and breakable. So you can see us there in the middle. This is one, the only, one of the only action shots that we got. <laughs> um, I like to joke that I was designed for comfort, not for speed. <laughs> um, the white water especially terrifies me because of the speed at which things happen. So when the call came to Rapid Grand Canyon, it was actually a terrified yes that came out of my mouth. I was terrified during our first big rapids. I was terrified in the mornings as we repacked our boats and people talked in hushed tones about the big rapids that were coming that day. I fully admit that I cried as we entered those first big rapids. I was that scared. One passage from the journal that I kept during my trip through the Grand Canyon summed up my fears. I'm scared, it said. I'm scared of scorpions, snakes, rapids, and some of these crazy group, group dynamics with these people that I don't know. <laughs> I also really see I have control issues. Being a passenger on an 18-foot inflatable rubber raft, being rowed by my beloved, who has not rowed a big boat in 18 years, does not lend itself to feeling in control. And then something remarkable happened. Just before one enormous roaring rapid, my husband Nelson came back after scouting it, and his face was very pale and pinched. And he looked at me and he said, do not fall out of the raft. And I was like, Psh, okay. And so in my journal, I note, I started to cry as we entered this rapid. The terror and the tears continued, even as Nelson successfully navigated us, upright and alive, through them. At some point during the trip, in order to stop focusing on the terror, I started counting in my head. One, two, three, four, five, to keep my brain from going crazy. And I realized most of these big rapids last about 14 seconds. I know, because I counted. <laughs> and just like that, my fears became smaller and more manageable. I realized 14 seconds goes by in a flash. And even though, I'm in, even though when I'm in a rapid, time will slow down in this very weird way. And, and water droplets will look like they're just floating by. And when my husband lost one of his oars in one of the big rapids, he was like, grab the oar. And I was like, what oar? That's why I'm reaching out the side of the boat to grab this giant oar that he needs to continue to get us through upright and alive. And so it was there that I learned that I could be bold and brave in just 14 seconds at a time. And so the trip spawned all kinds of things that I don't have time to go into today. But it spawned my Make Some Room Manifesto 
which is something that I believe very passionately about, all of those different statements. And then it turned into a book. I incorporated the manifesto into stories of my trip and wove them all together. It also caused a big move, which is what made me end up here in Western North Carolina. So, good stuff. But then, there was another book. Not mine, but this Guide to the French Broad River. There's an actual paddle trail for your river that runs right here. Or maybe it's right there. <laughs> My husband came home with this book last year, and he said, we can do this. He said, I've looked through it. He said, it's a great paddle trail. And he said, I think you and I, we together, could do this. So we started planning. I was the navigator. I told us where we needed to go each day, how many miles, and where to camp, and he rode the boat. People got wind of what we were doing. The newspapers called. We were interviewed on TV. It was kind of cool. We were like little celebrities. <laughs> this is our much smaller raft, 13 feet, loaded up with all our gear and all our food for 16 days. And on a Sunday, late in May last year, we launched our much smaller boat on the French Broad River, starting in Rosman, North Carolina, and floating 149 miles to Newport, Tennessee. Wow. Just the two of us, and it was grand. We ate well, and we took advantage of the lovely designated paddle trail campsites that are all along this river. We did experience some hardships. There were a number of trees, I think we counted nine in all, that had fallen across the river. Luckily, there were places we could sneak through so we did not have to unpack the raft and portage it around. We sat on the raft through really crazy thunderstorms and baked in the heat some days. And we did have to portage three times. There are three dams on the French Broad River that you have to go around. Ask me sometime about day number five, and I might use a curse word or two. It was a terrible day. So we portaged the first one, 800 pounds of gear around the dam, top to bottom. And then we met an angel for our second and third dam portages. His name was Dave Wave, and he runs the Asheville Outdoor Center. He came and helped, and we love him forever for that. But, despite it all, we kept smiling and had a very, very good time. The scenery was beautiful. That's near Hot Springs. That's near Painted Rock. A little bit of rapids. And after 13 days, we finish up all 149 miles, just the two of us. So here's the meat of my message today. Our imaginations can get the best of us if we let them. We tend to imagine the worst instead of the best. But in reality, many of those awful things that we imagine never ever come to pass. So I have a powerful four-part exercise for you. So if you've got a pen and a piece of paper, pull it out now. I learned this exercise from another writer, adventurer, and lifetime learner named Tim Ferriss. He wrote the four hour work week. So if you're willing to play along, we'll do this quickly. Part one, name what you are afraid of. <laughs> name it, write it down. What are you afraid of? And then the three parts become, define the worst thing that can happen. Define the worst thing that can happen. Next, spell out how you might prevent that thing from happening. Spell out how you might prevent that thing from happening. And then create a plan to repair or undo the damage if the worst thing does happen. And this is not just for big river trips. This is for business, for a personal life change, for anything that you want to do, anything you're afraid to try. 
That's part one of the exercise. It's fairly meaty. So, part two. Dream. At least part of the way. What would be the benefits of an attempt or partial success? What would be the benefits if you did it, if you tried it? How might your life change? What would be the benefits of an attempt or partial success? And then part three, weigh it. What is the cost of sticking to the status quo? If you didn't do it, you just kept doing what you're doing, how you're doing it. And then finally, step into regret. Ask yourself, what is the cost of your inaction? And don't just think of it now as keeping the status quo. Blow it out and get really familiar with it. What is the cost emotionally, physically, spiritually, relationally, financially, if you ignore that thing? And think about it not just today or next week, because that's kind of status quo stuff. Think about it six months from now one year from now, even three years from now, if you don't go for that thing that you're afraid of. I'm listening to Trevor Noah's book on Audible right now, and it's hilarious. I highly recommend it. And he says, this is the one thing that stuck out from that book that I was like, shabow, that's it. We spend so much time being afraid of failure, Amen. being afraid of rejection, but regret, regret is the thing we should fear the most. Regret is an eternal question that you will never have an answer to. If you don't even try, you will never ever know. So my question to you, what do you most fear doing, saying, or asking for? And I don't want you to promise to anybody except yourself that you'll try, that you'll go, that you'll do, that you'll at least make an attempt. And sometimes I've found that the hardest things to say or do or try happen in those little 14 second increments. So people always ask me, well, Angie, you've done this amazing river trip on the Colorado, and you've done the French Broad River, and you've done a whole bunch of stuff in between that I didn't even mention. Well, what's next for you? Because there always has to be a next when you're an adventurer. This is my next. <laughs> <laughs> most of what we own and lived in 200 square feet, so we're upsizing to like 300 square feet square. <laughs> My afraid thing right now is I have to learn to drive this thing. <laughs> it is big. It's like driving a bus. We found some subcontracting work that's flexible that will allow us to live our next dream, which is being full-time on the road. And we leave August 1st. Yay. We'll be traveling the country with our dog and our cat and having grand adventures and sharing them on Yukon and Bean. We said yes after running this idea through those four steps that I just gave you. We couldn't say no. We couldn't stick with the status quo. There had to be something more. So I will leave you with a quote on my manifesto. Be bold, be brave, even if you are scared shitless while you're doing it. <laughs> the things you will learn about yourself by stretching out of your comfort zone are things you cannot even imagine right now. My husband and I often say, six years ago, if you had told us the things we would have gone through, we would not have believed you. But the Grand Canyon trip was the catalyst. 
and then the French Broad trip was the second catalyst, and we just started dreaming and dreaming. Dreaming and dreaming. So I invite you, each of you, be bold and brave, even if you can only do it 14 seconds at a time. Even if you're crying. Because I believe that is what life is actually about. So live life well, live it fully, don't waste it. Go. Thank you. Uh -huh.